show seen throughout Australia on the National Nine Network. And now, he's done! Thank you very, very much. That's a lovely greeting. Hi. Hi. Good to see you, and welcome to the show, live from Melbourne, where tomorrow afternoon, that lady gets off her egg. <laughs> We're live from Melbourne, where tomorrow afternoon at 2.40, the entire country will come to a standstill for the running of the Melbourne Cup. An amazing event, uh, unlike any in the, in the entire world, for people that may not know about it. It's the one horse race of the year where the winning horse gets a gold cup and the loser gets a trip to America. <laughs> well. <laughs> and in order to figure out which horse will win the cup, Kevin Arnett has gathered together a panel of psychics tonight. And, um... Well, there's an emerald. We're also going to be ringing clairaudient Doris Stokes in London for her tip. Right. And, uh, don't, don't knock that. Remember, she could have been talking to Farlap. And as if that's not enough, we'll also have a computer selection, too. So if we can't get a winner in the Melbourne Cup out of all of that, then nobody's ever going to do it. So you folks keep watching, because we'll, we'll have a lot of fun with all of that tonight. And uh, our special guest tonight, our very special guest, is undoubtedly one of the most popular politicians in the country. The Premier of New South Wales, Mr. Neville Rand, will be here. And also, uh, our favorite chef, Peter Russell Clark, is here tonight, too. <laughs> Peter, Peter is going to show us tonight uh, the, the cheaper cuts of meat. Uh, he's going to show you how you can feed six people at 60 cents a head. That's the truth. Amazing, huh? He says he can do it. With the high price of beef, the cheaper cuts of meat, of course, have become very popular. I know a butcher who's made a fortune selling cow's lips. <laughs> well, <laughs> great at McDonald's. I'll have a lip burger. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, we're going to have a lot of fun with a special performance by the critically acclaimed, and you're going to love these kids, honestly, the Cambridge University Footlights Review are here tonight. You'll have a great time with them. British pop star Georgie Fame will perform, and to open the show, here's Philip Gould, sporting a mustache, mind you. You've got to have a look at this. The Tony Bartuccio dancers and a little dancing in the street. Put them together. Here we go. <laughs>
Fraser. That's Philip Gould, the Tony Bob Coot Show dancer. Dancing in the street, right, Sal? Like him myself. Thanks, kids. Really nice. Thank you very much on behalf of all of them. Thank you. Uh, this is the time of year when the whole country stops for a horse race, the Melbourne Cup. Now, that's unique in itself. And tonight, with the help of Kevin Arnett, we're taking a unique approach to predicting the winner. I don't think any of you have ever seen all of this come together at once. Welcome, Kevin Arnett. Well, you're here. Sir. Okay. We are going to have some fun. Well, I certainly you know, hope so, and I certainly hope that out of all of this, we get at least get somebody a winner. You know? Well, look, like you, I probably, I've never ever backed the winner of the Melbourne Cup. I can never ever choose the horse. And a few weeks ago, I woke up in the morning and said, now what can we do on the Don Lane show on, the, on, the, on Cup Eve? I thought, why not oh, yeah. have a psychic panel and see if one of the psychics can pick the Melbourne Cup, or maybe they'll all pick the same horse, which could be the winner. Well, when you say psychics, what do you mean? Or what, what? Uh, well, people like astrologers, uh, a tea leaf reader. I thought we'd bring in a clairvoyant, someone who does tarot cards. Uh, why not bring up someone like Doris Stokes, whom we all know has been pretty active with a lot of things. I mean, this is fantastic. Who It'll is Doris going to get in touch with, do you think, to find out the results? I, when thing? you ring her up in a minute, I would ask about Far Lap. No, she's not going to be I heard, I heard a little whinny from the other side. Did you? Yes. <laughs> yes but I had, well, yeah. The spirit side, I heard a whinny, right? Yeah, yeah. through yeah. the nose, but I'm only chaffing. Yeah. Uh, but seriously... <laughs> <laughs> Mike McCall Jones wrote the line. Yes, I thought so. Yeah. <laughs> and if that's no. not all enough, if, we, if all the psychics are not enough for you tonight, we're going to have one final bit of icing on the cake. We're going to have a computer technician with one of the latest Apple computers. He's got all the form of all the horses, their ages, their weight, all the things that they've won and so on, what they haven't won. He's going to press the buttons and that will come hopefully number one as well. So we're going to do that in just a moment. And we're going to meet all these people when we come back. Is that right? That's for sure. Okay. Yep. Well, we'll meet the whole bunch of them. Psychics, computer experts, Dara Stokes, the whole lot, and maybe a Melbourne Cup winner. Okay, we'll be back with Kevin and Bird and a whole lot of fun. Thank you very much for welcome back. Firstly, uh, before, uh, before we meet Kevin's experts, of course, we should say hello, and I really mean this when I say it. I don't know many people that know more about horse racing than this guy. He's got all the odds locked away in his head, and he knows all the horses. In fact, he's even owned a couple. Our own Bertram. <laughs> say hello to Bertram. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, John. Yeah. <laughs> Well done. What I'd like well, to do now, can introduce our psychic panel for tonight. Okay. First of all, we've got astrologer Kerry Culkins on the left. Yeah. Hello, Kerry. Kerry Culkins, say hello, ladies and gentlemen. That's good. <laughs> now, Kerry is what? Kerry, Kerry is an astrologer. She's doing astrology tonight to pick the winning horse. Kerry has been on our program before, but many years ago. About five and a half, she says. She's got a fantastic memory. Yeah, right, remember yeah. we, gave her, we gave her the date of uh, Hitler's birth, for example. It didn't say who it was, and she picked That's the character right. exactly right. I remember right. that. Nice I to have you back again, Kerry. Nice Thank to see you. Okay. Sitting next to Kerry is Anita Brown. Now, Anita's got a teacup in front of us, so she's going to read the tea leaves for us and try and pick the winner from that. Hello, Anita. <laughs> I thought we'd have to have a gentleman on the program, so we've got Jeff. Well, Willis. we assume he's a gentleman. Uh, well, he was on New Faces with Bert, so he has to be a gentleman. That's right, okay. So, uh, right. Jeff Willis is a clairvoyant. I'd like to meet Jeff, of course. Oh, okay. 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 Jeff is one of the best palm readers I've ever come across, and this is Kay McLennan, but Kay's not going to read palms I was going to say, how do you read a horse's palm? Uh, well, you have to have a horse, you have to have a horse's <laughs> hoof. Oh, and there's no horses so on the program. A, yes, there are. <laughs> Speak <laughs> so, <laughs> so, uh, there's, there's plenty of horses' hoofs around here. Now, there's someone who knows. Yes. So Kay is going to read the tarot cards. You're going to read the tarot cards? Oh, that'll be interesting. Yeah, I think so. Who do you take a reading on with the tarot cards? Uh, Sorry? Who do you... What, how do you take a reading on it? Well, I'll, there are 22 horses, fortunately, and there are 22 major arcana in the uh, of the cards. So and you'll I'll lay designate them each card to a horse. Okay. Shuffle the cards and pick right. three cards. Well, I don't want to jump ahead of the race, so right. you're in charge. And, of course, we've got the gentleman back there. Bro. Oh, of course, Ralph is going to do the computer at the end. Ralph, take that part first. <laughs> Hello, Ralph. You're very good. I just want you to know, if you people are convincing enough tonight, even Bert may change his bet. <laughs> you never know. Okay, where will we start? Well, look, how about starting with Kerry? Okay, Kerry. Well, 
looking from an astrologer's point of view, it doesn't look like it's going to be a particularly good day for favourites. Well, how do you know that? What it, uh... Uh, well, it's just a couple of planets up there that are going to get in the way of um, long, sh not long shots, but heavy weights and favourites coming up. It'll be more a day for taking a place bet uh -huh. than uh, going for a favourite. Um, I find it very hard to distinguish between two horses if I was taking a bet. Hyperno and um, Kiro Trelay. But I think I would actually have to go for Kiro Trelay. It's not outside of those. No. Second fave. But it's, is it? Yeah, about second, third fave. Oh, well, you just talked me out of it then, Bert. I, I think it is, Kevin. You've got some prices there. Uh, it would be a second. Uh, Kiro Trelay is neither yeah, two. It's second. Two. Yeah, the second. But I'd have to go yeah. for um, Hyperno. You're going to say Yeah, that's because I, I couldn't spell Kiro Trelay. <laughs> 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 Hyperno. Hyperno. Oh, but my cat's very keen on magistrates. Your what? Cat. Your cat. Your cat? I haven't got room to write that, I'm sorry. <laughs> your, your cat is very keen on... Mm. Well, when I was sitting having a look at horses today, it put its paw there. On and what? On magistrate. Put right little Where's tiny magistrate, magistrate what under was the high pro Magistrate's 16 to 1. Now, magistrate mightn't be a, a, a good, okay. might be a good outside bet. What it's, <laughs> well, it carries only 49 and a half, and it's written by Bobby Skelton, who's won more distance races you than anybody else in the world. Well, you ask for some information, yes. about <laughs> <laughs> I ask for some information, I get Lou Richards. Well, I'm <laughs> <fair enough. laughs> <It's been> magistrate. <laughs> magistrate, yeah. Then we've also got rather strange weather conditions likely to come up tomorrow. Oh, yeah. you know, yeah. November's oh. going to be one of the <laughs> 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 This is my weather forecast. Let's go on to the tea leaves. Well, this is Anita Brown. Anita Brown. Anita, now, how, do you, how long do you have to read the tea leaves before you get something out of that? Well, I've been looking at it already a little while, so I have a bit of an idea. It definitely looks like number three. Um, uh, number three. Our Paddy Boy. Right, yep. Yeah. So um, it means that Kevin should be betting on number three. I should. I put 50 cents, well, 50 cents each way. Cup, isn't it? it is my drink for tea. Yeah. Why does it right. look like number three in it? Do you get the image three or do well, you get... it just looks to me like number three. Right. So okay. We'll and you're used to reading tea leaves, so you would interpret them better than anybody, I suppose. Mm, well, this is my... You know, many people look, see completely different things that I do. What's our Paddy uh, Boy going for? Oh, it's uh, uh, 14 to 1. It's blown. 10, 10 to 1. Is no, it's 14 to 1 now, Kev. Oh, it's 14 to 1 now, yeah, 14 to 1. Yeah, 14 to 1. Well, okay. maybe I'll have, a, I'll have a little bit on that. Oh, I've made a bit of money left. Brent you're you're going to end up betting on everything. Now, Jeff Willis is a clairvoyant. What do you think, Jeff? Well, Farlap definitely won't win because he's stuffed. <laughs> We're feeling a little tired ourselves, but we're still doing the program, yes, aren't we? <laughs> now I go for um, Kingston Town. Well, yeah! uh, hey, hey, hey. Why, why do you go? Well, for... uh, it's very simple, actually. I've, four weeks ago, I had a vision that Kingston, Kingston Town would win, and I'm sticking with that. Where do you get these visions? Well, <laughs> <laughs> well sometimes in the bath. You know? Sometimes? Sometimes in the bath. In the bath. Yeah. Is this literally in the bath or the bathroom? In the bath. Well, it depends. Where, look, I can get a vision anywhere at any time. Well, so can I, but I mean, we're talking about <laughs> horses. <laughs> Sometimes you grab for whatever you can get, you know what I mean? <laughs> well, look. <laughs> you can't say anything here today, I'll tell you. So you, you got a yeah, vision. Four weeks ago, I had a vision that uh, Kingston Town would win, and um... in the bath, were you in the bath? <laughs> I was actually, yes. It's a good wet run. <laughs> <laughs> That's your pick. So Kingston? seriously, that is my pick, and okay. I'm sticking with it. Well, now we have Pam McLennan on who is okay. going to deal with the tarot cards. Okay, so now. <laughs> What's he want? <laughs> Why don't Kingston go off? What do I be about the short? Well, Kingston Town, but seven to one now. Seven to one. Yeah. Um, now listen, with the cards, uh, how do you know, uh, without it getting too complicated, there's 22 cards there, you say? Yes. Right? How do you know which ones to pick out for what, I mean, is, how do you know which one's going to do well? Well, I designate each card to the horse. So the you ho designate the yes, card to the horse? To the horse. So one through 22, is that yes. what you're saying? Yes. Well, how do you know which card is one? Do they go in a certain well, I, order? I, I, mem I memorize the cards. I know the cards. Right. Okay. I still don't understand, but I'll say right, I look very intelligent then. That's good. <laughs> okay, you tell us. Um, I have, uh, between two horses in particular, Hyperno and uh, the New Zealand horse, the Grey. The one Kira you Trelay. can't spell and I can't say. Kira yes, Trelay. yes, Kira Trelay. Yes. My long shot would be 19. 
Flashing light. Flashing light. Flashing light. Yeah, right. Flashing light. Yes. So, what's your first one again? I would say flashing light. First one. Okay, yeah. but flashing light. Flashing light. Well, yeah. there's a long shot for you. Flashing yeah. light. Okay, well, now we got Doris Stokes. Do we on the line? Yes. If you pick up the phone, I don't think you find Which Doris one? is this there one here? already. Yeah. This the one? Hello. Hello. Hi, Doris. Don Lane. How are you? Hello, Don. My love. Just a minute, everybody. Give it a round of applause. Doris Stokes. Hello. Doris. Have you, have you had any thoughts or any visions or any ideas about the Melbourne Cup? Well, I've tried, Don. I don't usually do this sort of thing, you know. Yeah, otherwise you'd be, you'd be flying your own jet across the Pacific. Uh, but yes, I have. Yes? Um, I came up with our Paddy Boy. Our Paddy Boy. Now, how did you get that, Doris? Paddy Boy. Uh, El Lavina. Hang on, she's going to name the whole field here. You got. El Lorena. El Lorena. Our Patty Boy and El Lorena. Yeah. Yes, but the one I go for most is Flashing Light because I think the co jockey's name is Cooper. And what, and what has that got to do with anything? Well, I picked up the jockey's name first. You mean you heard the name Cooper before you heard anything else? Yes, I, I usually get. I don't bet, but if I do ever do, I look for the jockey. Right. The jockey's name first, Cooper. Okay, Doris, thank you very, very much. And uh, we'll put down flashing light on the board for you, and thanks for taking the time and participating with us, Doris. Well, may I just say love to everyone? Oh, everybody here still... All my friends all over Australia. Just a minute, say a quick hello to Bert. Quick, quick. Hello, Doris. Hello, Bert, my love. How's Uncle Charlie? What, my love? How's Uncle Charlie? Nice to talk to you, my love. Yes, a love from your mum, darling. Thank you very much. Here's Don. All oh, my love to Peter and Dan and all my friends all over Australia. OK, here's Don. I Bye. Thank you constantly. <laughs> so long, Doris. Thank you very much, hon. So long, my love. Bye-bye. OK, we got flashing lights. <laughs> Okay, well, it's uh, well, we should go just, before, just before we go to the computer, one question. Do any of you get any sort of um, other idea about this race? Like, do you anticipate anything uh, happening, anything bad, anything good, anything? Do you get any other message about the race? Anybody? Just, I'm just throwing this out at you just in case. Yes. What? I think the conditions, there are conditions within the race that will be very unexpected. It could be a mishap. And uh, I think it'll be a very close finish. And I feel there's a fourth horse involved in the finish. It'll be, it'll be, a, very, it'll be a very close decision between, actually, two horses that will make such a close finish that it will be very hard to decipher which one it is. Anybody else? I believe the same. You believe the same? Yeah, it'll be a very close uh, finish. Anything? I, I sort of get a, a feeling of fights between jockeys. Fights between jockeys? Yeah. That's all. I like it when they stand up on a saddle and sort of punch it out. Yeah, <laughs> I think so. You know, elbows. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, well that's interesting. We can look for it. Now let's see what yeah. the computer has. Well, let's, let's turn to technology. We've done the psychic thing. Now let's go to technology. We've got Ralph Pankhurst over there with the computer. So, Ralph, we'd like you to do a little reading for us in your way, of course, with technology and see what you come up with. Now, Ralph, uh, what, what's been fed into this machine? We've fed all the data on all the horses that are running in the race and... Uh, a little bit of luck, we'll have the winner for you. Okay, well, punch it up. Let's see what we come up with. <laughs> oh, look at this. <laughs> oh, dear. Enter I'll weather. a little bit of help from you, Kevin. You need some... Oh, well, I'll the weather the tomorrow wind. is going to be fine. We're expecting late storms, but it should be fine <laughs> at least for the race. <laughs> the storm should come between five and six because I was talking to Uncle Charlie. Okay. But it will be fine. Fine. Okay. Shall we say the track's going to be fast? Fast, yeah. Fast, yeah. Yep. You ready? Yes, yep. we're ready to go. There <laughs> <laughs> we are third place. Oh, oh, that's an interesting one. Look at this. Look at this. No, no peer. peer. How about that? No peer. All right, then, there we go with no peer. Okay.
Well, I don't know if we helped you or not. We've come up with what? One, two, three, four, five horses. Just a minute. Thank you very, very much, all of you, for coming in and participating. And we'll see who has the, uh, uh, the better psychic ability, I suppose, or something, or who is closest. Thank you for the computer. And now, the final oh, just, word. Excuse me. Sorry. The winner you want? Yes. Deck the Holes. That's my horse! <laughs> <laughs> I go with Deck the Holes, too. Anyway, thank you for joining us. Okay, we'll be back with Georgie Fain, the Cambridge Footlighters. Thank all these beautiful people, and Bird and Kevin and everybody for joining us. We'll be back. Thank you very much. Georgie Fame has long been hailed as Britain's best blues artist and jazz singer. He has an infectious enthusiasm. He's been delighting audiences around the world now for almost 20 years. Imagine that, being on the top for 20 years. You'd probably best remember him for his huge hit a few years back, The Ballad of Bonnie and Clyde. He's singing a song tonight. It's really a cute one I think you'll like. It's called Drip Drop. Why don't you please make him welcome? Here's Georgie Fame. Yeah? All right. Come on. The, the longest playoff in history. It's great. Over there. Yeah, That's terrific. It. it was a Hoagie Carmichael song you just did. Yes, indeed, yeah. yeah. Hoagie forgot he'd written it, practically. A lot yeah. of people may not remember Hoagie Carmichael, but he wrote a lot of big hits. Stardust oh, and a few others. Yeah. In fact, Georgia really, on my mind. That's right. Upper yeah. Leisure River. Georgia, uh, um, what am I saying? Willie Nelson. Uh, oh, actually, yeah, that was a it, wonderful it, album. Yeah. yeah did Stardust a, album. Yeah. Right, yeah. Did a the Nearness of You. The list is endless, you know, it just goes on. He has a couple of comedy songs that I actually do in the act, Hokey Carmichael song. So one's called uh, Hugging and a Chalking. Oh, yeah, she's that, so yeah. big. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, that. You so big. <laughs> well, you don't know what he's doing. It's about a girl that's so big and fat that when you go to hug her, you have to chalk a mark and go around and see where you began. You see? <laughs> yeah, a cute song. And you formed your own label now, huh? Yeah, yeah. I've got two labels. I've got the Riff Raff for the RAF. Yeah. Sir. Oh, sorry. All right. Dib, dib, dib. And uh, the Bald Eagle label, which is the Hoagie Carmichael album. Mm. Um, it's all done with Hoagie's consent. Um, it's totally nerve-wracking for me. I mean, it's like being on the show. We went and knocked on Hoagie's door with the, with the album oh. and said, here's the album, you're singing on it. I uh, hope you like it. How old is he now? He's 81. Wow. In fact, 81. he's 82 next week, I think. Mm. And you wrote a song about Greg, Ch Greg Chappell. Is that right? Yeah, indeed, yeah. Because I think I've, I've got a whole project in mind about doing songs for great people like yourself who are the oh, best at what they do. Yes, thank you very much. Yes, I only wish. If I was in Greg Chappell's class, I would be worried, yeah. But that's a, that's a terrific idea. Well, yeah, Alex Higgins is my favorite snooker player. Greg Chappell's my favorite cricketer. Ah, oh, so you're going to uh, do it Ray about Ray Charles all is my favorite blues singer. Right. The Red Arrows are my favorite aerobatic team. Oh, fantastic. And uh, your band is my favorite band. This okay. band should this band. And you made some new friends out here. Why don't you thank them? Will you go off here? I'll tell everybody where you're going to be appearing, okay, and give them all the dates. Thank Georgie Payne. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If, uh... If you'd like to see Georgie Fame perform, he'll be at Scamps up in Sydney the 5th, 6th, 7th of November. Mr. Ward's down here in Melbourne the 9th to the 14th of November. The Basement in Sydney the 15th to 18th of November. The Tivoli Hotel in Adelaide and the Hyde Park Hotel out in Perth. So everybody everywhere has got a chance to see him. Uh, we'll give you a quick rundown on the horse race just before uh, we go. Kerry Culkin, who um, picked Hyperno. Uh, Anita Brown, the tea leaf lady. She picked our patty boy. Jeff Willis, uh, the clairvoyant pick Kingston Town. Kay McLennan with the tarot cards picked Flashing Light. Dara Stokes also picked Flashing Light. The computer picked No Peer. 
and Bert and I pick deck the halls, okay? Well, <laughs> you got a wide variance of things there, but uh, that's just from about every area you can get. So if you're looking for a tip or you want to go on your instincts, uh, you got something else to help you, all right? The Cambridge University Footlights Review have just finished a very successful season in Perth. Uh, they can be seen in Adelaide from tomorrow till Saturday. Then they're in Melbourne and Hobart and Canberra and Sydney and Brisbane. Uh, you just check your papers, you'll find out where they are. The critics have had some wonderful things to say about the review, and the audiences just love them. I, I haven't seen write-ups like that in a long time. They're here tonight with a skit for us that has to do with one of the hazards of television, these kind of shows. <laughs> uh, the real hazards being interviewers and interviewees. Would you please welcome the five members, the brilliant five members, of the Cambridge University Footlights Review. Say hello. Hey. Street violence in Britain is a major problem. Now, who are the kids involved in these riots? Well, with me is a young lady by the name of Ronnie Knackers. Now, <laughs> Ronnie, I believe you are a punk. No, please, Nane. I'm a hell's angel. Oh, really? But, but I thought the green hair and the safety pins were very much the signs of the punk rocker. No, 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 no. I'm wearing these, cos... Oh, yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah, I am a punk rocker. Yeah. <laughs> no, I beat up Hell's Angels. That was the source of my confusion, I believe. Yes, well, also with me is Sydney Cranium. Now, <laughs> you, I believe, are a skinhead. No, oh, bleeding mate, I'm a suede head. A suede head? Yeah, uh, it's like a skinhead, only our hair is slightly longer, and we wear suede bother boots. <laughs> Suede bother boots? Yeah, crush puppies. <laughs> <laughs> yes, now, now what about this new gang that's been formed, the Rude Boys? Oh, I hate Rude Boys. Rude Boys, boys make me puke. <laughs> <laughs> and, and do you beat up Rude Boys? No. Uh. Why's that? Well, because if you beat them up, then they're rude to you. I don't like that. <laughs> you don't like them being rude to you? No, it's rude. Yeah, you know, it'd be all right if they came up to us and insulted us and said stuff like, I hate punks, punks, punks might be puke. puke. <laughs> but they don't. No. They don't. They come out with, what? Uh, sardonic asides. Yeah. Yeah. And muttered, muttered comments of an acerbic nature. Yeah. <laughs> well, don't, don't you beat them up even if they're very, very rude to you? No, nah, no. Nah. Tell me daddy goes around their house and he beats them up. <laughs> I see. So is your dad a skinhead or a punk? No, nah, he's a policeman. <laughs> yes, well, well, also with me is a member of one of the oldest gangs in the country. Good evening, John Pym. Uh, hello. <laughs> now, you, I believe, are... A, ru a roundhead. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and, and you go back even further than the Rockers and the Teds. Uh, yes, in fact, we are pre-Rolf Harris. <laughs> Yes, to 1640, in fact. And, and have you any similarities to the punks, the mods, the greasers? Uh, well, your greaser has long, greasy hair, and your greaser goes around on beat-up BSAs, shouting, we hate mods, mods make us puke, whereas uh, we roundheads, uh, we tend to go around on horseback, shouting, out with the Presbyterian royalists. Yes, now, now all these... All these gangs seem to have some hero figure or other. The punks had Sid Vicious, the skinheads had Slade. I suppose for you it must be Oliver Cromwell, Lord Protector. No, Barry Manilow. <laughs> really? Why is that? Oh, because we like his music. Mm -hmm. Oh, and in his quieter moments, I believe that he wants to see King Charles I hanged just as much as we do. <laughs> now, some of us roundheads are getting into Neil Sedaka. But I think that for our image of strict puritanical rule, he's a bit puffy. <laughs> yes, one final question, John. Why do you go around in gangs beating people up? Protection. Protection from what? All these flaming Vikings roaring about the place. <laughs> I hate Vikings. Vikings, Vikings might be too. <laughs> <laughs> Cambridge University Footlights Review. We'll be back with the premier of New South Wales never ran after the questions. Another hand for these folks. That's lovely. Thank you. You all know that uh, 
You all know that Heinz turns a lettuce into a salad with all these great salads and salad dressings. There's uh, celery salad and potato salad and coleslaw and uh, mayonnaise, or if you like something uh -huh. stronger, English salad green. Uh -huh. Well, Bert, Bert has the magic bug, and he reckons he can turn a lettuce into a salad as well. So here he is, the hub of the magic circle, that side plate among sorcerers, the great Alberto. Thank you. Thank you, enough, enough, enough. We have here a lettuce, as you can see. Right. I place my top hat over the lettuce, and, you, and, you and I say magic words. And you reckon you can turn that lettuce into what? Into a, into a salad. Really? OK, yeah, okay. here we go. Right. Abracadabra canoe, oh. abracadabra calane. I am better looking than Morton Lane. Right. One, two, three. Hmm. One, two, three. One, two, three. Oh. One, two, three. He came out and plugged it in too soon. <laughs> oh, is it, there's no boom. No, no, he blew it. Oh. I'm the one person who knows The kid came out and he plugged it in, and when he plugged it in, it went poof and blew up. And then he just ran off and never bothered about putting another one down. And I assumed they had told you there wasn't going to no be one, any poof. No one told me. There I am. I'm standing okay. here with no poof. Forget it. Scratch it. <laughs> one, two, three, bang. Thank you. Excellent. Excuse me. Come here. What? Come here, would you please? Hurry up. Come over here. Just lay down on the floor here. Lay down on the floor. And when I say one, two, three, say bang. One, two, three, say bang. Hang on. Around the other way so we can hear you. So we can see you. Turn on. Okay. One, two, three. Bang! Get out of here. Now. Oh, wait you see? Without the poof, I can't do it. But wait on. What? Abracad I've got <laughs> You turned the lettuce into a rabbit. Look at that. The rabbit wants to eat the lettuce. It loves it. Ah, yes, indeed, my friend. That was too much. What about some sausage? <laughs> That's, wait a minute. That's too much hocus and not enough pocus. Forget about That's it. That's the story of my life. Too much hocus and not enough pocus. There, are, there you are, folks. Remember, only Heinz turns a lettuce into a salad, hey, and not magicians, I however crafty started. they are. Look at this. What? <laughs> Time for your disappearing trick. Ah, yes. One, what? two, three. So long. We'll be back in a minute. Don't go away. We'll Don't be back. Fine. <laughs> Thank you very much. Welcome back. In a series of opinion polls taken across Australia during the, the uh, state's pre-elections earlier this year, the New South Wales Premier Neville Wren was voted Australia's most popular politician. And the campaign commercials told the story here. When you consider we used to have the highest unemployment, now we've got the lowest. Well, it's just got to be. Well, in September this year, that popularity was reinforced when he was re-elected back into office for the next three years by an overwhelming margin that was termed a Ranslide victory. Did that land over there? Yes, it did, right. It's a pleasure to welcome him tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, the premier of New South Wales, Neville Rand. Say hello. Huh? How are you? In all the years that I've lived here and everything, I never had you on the program. I'm really amazed at that today when we were, we were discussing it, you know? Nice to have you here. Well, I come down the night before the Melbourne Cup. Yeah. Better go home early in the morning. You're not going to stay for the Cup? Well, it's a disgrace, really. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's not that bad, but I mean, yeah. Do you, have you gone to Melbourne Cups before? Undoubtedly. Yes, yes I've yes. been to a few Melbourne Cups. Indeed, uh, you know, there's a lot of rivalry between Sydney and Melbourne, but mm -hmm. I must say this. Melbourne's got the big two spectacular sporting events. That's the Melbourne Cup and the VFL final. There's no doubt about that. They sure do. I think. I'm sorry to say it. You're a rugby league supporter, you know. It, but it is the truth, isn't it? I mean, uh, I have never... Uh, when I tell people in other parts of the world that we have a horse race here that stops the country cold, uh, my first year here in 1965 was in Sydney, and 
the race went, the race started, and I saw taxi cabs pulling over to the side of the street and buses stopping, <laughs> and I thought this is really something, you know, an amazing sure. event, isn't it? Yeah. Well, it's very much uh, Australia. Mm. Um, we Australians have got uh, lots of uh, lots of great things going for us, and uh, one of the few days of the year that brings Australians together is Melbourne Cup Day, mm. and uh, it's part of our history. And I think it's wonderful the way in which we keep it up each year and the way it's going. Uh, well, I saw all your uh, clairvoyance. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's still as hard to pick as ever. When we get to the, just before we leave and say goodbye tonight, I'll ask you for your tip. Hold on to it, okay? okay. You must have one. Uh, your throat problems, of course, were very well publicized. Uh, your voice went totally, completely. Sure. Um, and of course, the, the prophets of doom were out in full force saying that's the end of Neville Rand. He's finished now. He can't talk. Uh, yeah. what, did that ever worry you? Did you ever think maybe this was it, that you were finished? Well, for a short time I did, um, because quite apart from being a politician, I'm a barrister, so uh, mm. I really need a voice either to uh, be in politics or practice my profession. And for many weeks, I had no voice at all. And uh, for a week or so, no one really knew why I didn't have a voice. Mm. And uh, it turned out to be a fairly Had you seen, you saw experts and things at that time while you were no, going through? No, I was, uh, I was in hospital for a fairly minor operation and, uh, and uh, I lost my voice. And it was really the end of a long chain of events. Uh, I had a paralysis of a cord that mm. just slipped sideways so that instead of the two cords sitting like that, when you speak, your cords vibrate. Mm. One of my cords was pushed well away from center so that the air just rushed through and then you had that <laughs> sort of uh, effect. Yeah. And that's, uh, well, I must say it was uh, a bit depressing for a while. But then... Uh, but you never panicked about it. You never thought this could be the finish. Oh, no, no way. I don't think uh, in this day and age with mechanical things with your body that it's ever the finish. The doctors are so clever now. Mm that uh, they can't altogether give you a new head, but they can uh, uh, do a lot of other things. There's a lot of other parts can be replaced. Yeah, right. right. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, uh, yes, Tom. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, I had a very good doctor and, uh, and a lot of support from a lot of people. Mm. People were very, very kind at that time. And now I'm pleased to say, whilst uh, I can't yet sing Rigoletto and don't yeah. think I ever will, <laughs> I've got a possible sort of a voice. Mm. You must have been very pleased with this election result. I mean, this was an absolute landslide for you. Uh, it, um, when you're a politician, I, I read an article, and I, I, I must quote the article, um, because he said that you promised 22 things and uh, you didn't come good on 10 of them, which is a great uh, feat for a politician. Uh, when you make politician, as a politician, you make promises. Sure. Uh, uh, how many of those, do you make those with the idea in your mind that you're going to keep them or to course. win votes? Or? Of course. You always, uh, when you make the promise, hope that you're going to keep the promise. Indeed, you expect to keep the promise. Uh, and I think most people, irrespective of their political persuasion, whether they're Labor, Liberal, I don't count the country party so much, but uh, uh, Labor and Liberal, they try to do what they say. And mm. uh, there are all sorts of circumstances intervene and uh, it might be uh, interest rates go up, uh, the capacity to raise loans uh, becomes difficult, or priorities change, mm. and you find that you've got to spend more money in one direction than you intended to, so you've got to take it from somewhere else, because running a government is uh, very much like a household budget. You've got so much money to spend, and you can only do so much with it each year, and you've got to determine what's the sensible way to do it. It always confuses me that some people be able, seem to be able to handle that and other people seem to not be able to handle it at all and just come up with excuses. I want to talk to you about image as well. You've got a great image. You dress very well. Does is, is someone uh, take the time with you or do you do that on your own? I mean, do you have somebody that has an overall look no, at you and say you need to change The only, the only uh, uh, thing about my dress uh, that's uh, not my selection are my ties. My wife picks my ties. All right, but, uh, Jill. Yeah. Right. We, uh, you, uh, you came up with, uh, or someone came up with a nickname for you, and of course it was publicized all across the country on one of the greatest nights in Australia, which was a command performance. Uh, well, I just want you to see this here. Have a look at sure. this. Here. Have we got it? Hmm. How do you like it so far? Is it all right? Well, <laughs> I look good. I, I think you look terrific, and I think it's great for you. Here it goes. <laughs> okay. I admit there might be the odd VIP here. I noticed one odd VIP as I walked in. 
nibble around the Premier New South Wales. There you go, Nifty. <laughs> <laughs> now, there was an argument going on today as to whether Nifty was your nickname before or did Paul just give you that? Oh, no, 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 no. No, I got that nickname uh, donkey's years ago when I was, uh, when I was a young barrister. And uh, Hang on. What is this? Where we can see for ourselves up close, what a shifty lot they were. <laughs> um, present, uh, present company uh, accepted, of course. <laughs> Pity, it's got a nice ring to it, hasn't it? Shifty nifty. <laughs> you keep turning up at these dudes, mate, you're going to become a regular part of my act. <laughs> uh, yeah. He's great, Paul. Uh, Paul, Paul. Paul really has a way of hitting it right on the head for Australians. We were talking the other day about he is a real Australian comic, you know, and he just gets into those things everybody else seems to bypass. Tell me about the nifty thing, I'm sorry. Well, that was a long time ago, long before I got into politics, but because now that I, uh, I attract uh, much more public attention as a politician, the nickname's better known, but it was, uh, it was a solicitor. Didn't brief me very much, but uh, he often appeared in cases instructing other barristers against me and he was a sort of uh, character who had a nickname for everybody. I became Nifty. Uh, Jim McClelland, who was then uh, a solicitor, later Senator Jim McClelland, then um, he's now Mr. Justice McClelland. He became Diamond Jim. Uh, John Kerr, in those days, uh, was a QC. He became Long John Silver because he had this big mop of white hair. And lived up to it. Uh, and yes, lived sir. up to it. Yes. <laughs> I better not say much. Yes, I, no, I don't no. want it to. So. Uh, <laughs> then there was a judge who had a sort of a pencil moustache, you know, those pencil line moustaches yes. and a big white beard. And this uh, solicitor character called him uh, the Captain from Castile. Ah. <laughs> so he had a nickname for everybody and I, uh, I scored nifty <laughs> and uh, it rather stuck. I, I must talk to you about uh, casinos. Sure. Uh, you just made a momentous decision, or at least uh, took a step forward into that sure. direction. Uh, Mr. Peterson, of course, has uh, said time and time again there will be no casinos in Queensland. Uh, down here, this has been a, a, uh, uh, a big battle down here, of course, a lot of political upheaval. And you've just gone ahead and said, well, we're going to look into the possibilities, and we think, or you are positive that you are going oh, no. to go ahead with... Uh, no. uh, the situation is that uh, uh, Queensland, although Mr. Peterson for a long time said there'd be no casinos there, has now decided there will be casinos and they're in the process of uh, selecting uh, the uh, uh, companies which will run the casinos. Mm. Uh, there are casinos in Tasmania, uh, Northern Territory, Central Australia. There's an application for a casino in uh, the Australian Capital Territory, Canberra. And, uh, but none in the two biggest states in Australia. I think it's the, the point that I'm getting states. at. I can't believe And it. in our state, we've, uh, for donkey's years, we've had this flare up from time to time uh, about illegal casinos. And for a long time, I've taken the view that the best way to get rid of the problem of illegal casinos is to have legal casinos. Mm. In that way, the public and the general public doesn't gamble in casinos much at all, as far as I'm aware. It's generally speaking, uh, uh, people with a, more money than the average, uh, professional gamblers, uh, people out on the town for a big night out, tourists particularly uh, seem to uh, uh, like a uh, gambling night. And uh, uh, the decision that we've taken is uh, that we'll uh, certainly have legalised casinos in New South Wales. Uh, we don't know quite what form they'll take yet. Uh, we had a, an inquiry up there. The judge uh, recommended uh, it be on the lines of the London casinos that are smaller places uh, mm. with no entertainment, uh, no uh, function rooms and so on. I don't know that that would appeal to Australians at this stage. Uh, and, and since the judge recommended the London system, uh, the London system has come into some notoriety itself uh, because there have been all sorts of suggestions they were breaking the law. Mm. and. Uh, well, talking, talking about the law breaking, yep. too, the, there were the, the uh, Anglican Dean of Sydney today, uh, Lance Shilton, said casinos and SP betting will become a bonanza to organize crime and a handout to the racing lobby. Yeah. Uh, well, can I say, I just don't follow that at all, because does anyone suggest that federal hotels who run, who run uh, Rest Point in uh, Hobart are organized crime? No, they're definitely uh, that, not. Uh, they're I in know. some lobby. Uh, it's just crazy. If you get people, if you get a corporation, 
that's uh, known, that's respected, got a good record. Why should there be any talk of organised crime? And I mm. think uh, there's too much loose talk. Of course we've got organised crime in Australia. Of course we've got bad criminals. No city like Melbourne with three million people, no city like Sydney with three and a half million people can expect not to have crime, can expect not to have people who are prepared to take risks for big money. And uh, I believe that uh, too much attention is uh, being paid to this so-called organised crime uh, from the pulpit sometimes and not enough attention to the real crime of drugs and drug addiction and the, uh, and the sort of crime that's eating away at our young people and indeed killing many of them. Mm. And uh, uh, if the state can have reputable people running gambling, if the state can run gambling, then I can't see why there should be any organized crime associated with it. I know it's a big income in Nevada because uh, it practically supports the state. What do you reckon, just on a, a rough estimate, what do you reckon the state would make out of um, uh, gambling casinos in New South Wales? Well, I would hope within a very short space of time of making 20 to 30 million dollars, but uh, that's only in a short space of time. It depends how many uh, casinos you had. Uh, we wouldn't want to have many of them to start off with because mm. we'd want to walk before we ran. We'd want to know uh, uh, what our capacity is to run them. Uh, we'd want to know what's a fair share of the revenue for the public because uh, it's going to be a revenue that goes into the public accounts and to be expended on, uh, on public uh, needs and services. Um, but from any point of view, it must be very substantial money. You're going to find out pretty quick whether it's a popular move or not, aren't yeah. you? Well, well it's, a, it's a pretty bold step for you to take, I think. Well, generally speaking, the surveys, and I'm, I watch the surveys fairly closely, the surveys show that more Australians think uh, casino gambling should be legal than not. In other words, there's a majority for legalisation. That doesn't mean that a majority of Australians would go to casinos. I don't believe they would any more than when uh, we... Uh, legalized Sunday hotel trading in New South Wales. Everybody in New South Wales goes to a hotel on Sundays. Mm. But there are some people who go to a hotel on Sundays. Who's going to win the Melbourne Cup? Well, that's a difficult question, but uh, I think it'll be a Sydney, Quinella, Kingston town and uh, just a dash. <laughs> well, that's fair enough. Say hello to your daughter, Kim, for okay. me. Tell her I said hello. Sure. Thank you. Neville Rand, ladies and gentlemen, will be back with another piece from the Cambridge Footlighter. Stay here. Yeah. Howdy doody. Well, tough eve, eh? You're gonna be the you're gonna be the premier of a state soon. So. Do you reckon? Yeah. What sort of state would I have the state in, do you reckon? Oh, I don't know. Anything. State of chaos? Nice. They may find they may find a, a state just for you. Make you premier. What would be the first law you'd pass? I think I'd uh, deport you. <laughs> <laughs> I'd okay. leave you here. It's Cuppy. Have you got a tip? Yes, I certainly have, Don. My tip is bananas. I thought it was going to yes. be something like that. Yeah. Don, they're an all-time favourite, you should realise. that They're favourite because everybody loves that banana flavour. Uh, here's one of the, the great chefs of Australia's best banana recipes. Have a look at this. Where are you, Billy Banana? Come on, down you come. Here he comes. There are sausages. I'll go and help you. Well, before we finish the year, he's going to take a nosedive here. <laughs> it could be this evening. This is it. Down it comes. This is called time. Baron of uh, Lamb, Queensland. Right. It's a creation of Andre Perez, who really? is the, the chief chef of Le Provencal in oh. Sydney. Right. Isn't Doesn't that nice. look lovely? Where's the, nice. It looks very nice, but where's the banana? Well, the, the lamb is boned and then stuffed with banana. That's the, that's the idea, and it really gives it a magnificent flavor. And the recipe for, I know, Family Circle. Magazine. That's the one. I knew it, right. That's where you find all the great chef's best recipes. Uh, for flavor and nutrition, why don't you <laughs> banana fry? Yes, bung in a banana. Yay. <laughs> One of the great events in Melbourne is taking place this weekend. There's a Ligon Street Festa over in Carlton. And uh, on Friday next, I'm going to be there from 12 noon. I'm going to be in the parade, and we're going to be awarding some prizes for the best shop. It's going to be a great weekend, the Ligon Street Festa, and I'll be out there. So I hope to see some of you out there, too. Uh, this is a very interesting number here from this very talented lady. Send in the Clowns is probably one of the most performed and listened to songs in contemporary music. You've all heard everybody do it. I mean, there's not an entertainer nationally that hasn't attempted it at least once. Well, Emma, from the Cambridge University Footlights Review, saw it on television just once too often. So she decided she'd make up her own words and do her own send-up version, aptly titled, Send Up the Genre. 
is empty. Footlights reviews. The Peter Russell clock is here tonight, all set for the Melbourne Cup, and armed with some tips. Not on a cup, but for your table, okay? Peter Russell clock, say hello. Here you go. Uh, thank you, thank you. Why are you carrying the meat in the, in the uh, dish? Mate, you might think that that's. Uh... The Flemington favourite, let me tell you it's not. That's gravy beef. <laughs> right. Which is the cheapest and best flavoured beef you could buy. Uh-huh. I don't want you to think that because um, I'm talking about beef and horse races that I've muddled them up at all. Because, <laughs> you see, at the moment the beef industry is in a bit of trouble because um, we seem to ship some meat over there that didn't go too well. Uh -huh. But it's not the first time we've done that because when we shipped over Farlap, it left a bad taste in the Australians' uh, mouths. Now that we've shipped over, sort of like Farlap packaged, it's left the bad taste in the Americans' mouths. Right, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, there's a couple of, because being serious now, there's been a couple of scoundrels in the industry, a couple of rogues, who have not only mucked the industry up for the Americans, for the overseas market, it's mucked it up here at the home market because Australians have stopped buying red meat. Mm -hmm. uh, now, because they think it's something else, is Yeah, they reckon yeah. it's kangaroo or camel or donkey. And if it was, it wouldn't matter as long as you labelled kangaroo or donkey. Because, you know, I mean, why not eat kangaroo? Mm. You know, except they're a national emblem and all that sort of thing. But the labelling was the naughty thing, not the product. But we here seem to think that, that every, every piece of meat is going to jump out of the pan at you or something, mm. and that's wrong. A couple of years ago, mate, a couple of years ago it was butter. If you ate a bucket full of of butter, they reckon you get ingrown toenails or, or a distended bladder or something. Uh, then if you, if you drank milk, you got mammary glands or something. In fact, a lady <laughs> phoned me up. <laughs> a lady phoned me up and said... Mammary glands. I'm sorry, yes. Go ahead. They said, you shouldn't be uh, drinking milk because we're the only mammals that continue to, uh, to drink milk after we've been weaned. And I said, well, maybe that's why we've been clever enough to get to the moon because we're the only ones that do it. That could be. Right. Come on over here, right. we'll talk about it. So you're going to talk about the cheap cuts of meat that people can actually uh, um, purchase and buy and make meals out of. Right. Is that true, 60 cents a head for six people? Uh, 60 cents a head? Well, yeah. it could be for, for 600 people, 60 cents a head. Right. Well, with vegetables, it's about 10 bob. But you've got to have a pressure cooker. When my old mum uh, was cooking, we always ate cheap cuts like tongue, and, and oxtail, not kangaroo tail, that's oxtail. Why does everybody go like that? I've heard of oxtail for years. It's, if it's cooked right, well, it has to be potted or something, doesn't it? Yeah, stewed, what right. they call it? So it's cut up, yeah. shoved in there, pour a glass of wine, will you, mate? Sure. That's shoved in a, in a pressure cooker. And when you got engaged in Australia, it was a great trick to be given a pressure cooker. Darren Hinch has been given eight. <laughs> 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 hey, Darren. He's been, he's been given more than that, mate. Yeah. Uh, I'll have another one, mate. Yeah. The, oh, yeah, mate. So all you do is shove food in there, meat. That would normally take three and a half hours So what you, you chopped up an oxtail. Right. And, uh, and that beef that you came out here. Gravy beef, Gravy shoved beef. both in. Thanks very much, mate. Um, Two glasses and, of wine and some... Yeah, it doesn't matter. And a bit of this, whatever the herb is, marjoram. marjoram. Shove it in there, whack the top on it, turn the gas on, and vegetables, wherever they are. I don't know where they are. Shove those in. Well, <laughs> yeah. whatever you like. If you like right, carrots, you put them in, or parsnips, <clears throat> or pumpkin, or potatoes, doesn't matter. Handful of those, throw in there, yeah. right? Put in some tomato sauce if you want to, whatever you like. Turn the gas on, leave that for 35 minutes, and it comes out cooked. Like right? that? Yeah. So for 35 minutes. This is the final thing of that? Yeah. Well, that's well, the that tail. Well, that looks very nice. Of course it looks nice. Well, is, that, is that also boko? Yeah, well, it's not really. Osobuku comes from up here. The but round bone, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah and it yeah. means bone with a hole in it. Can you know that because you told me earlier today? A bone, hole with a bone with a hole in it. Yeah. Also boko, right? Yeah. Uh, now, now, what is all of this? Right. These are other parts. Right. So oh, I'm loving this. Th the point I make is a tongue. If you say, "How about eating a heart?" People vomit straight away, don't they? You're exactly right. I couldn't go that myself. But 
You only don't like it because of the visual of it and the verbal. It's called a heart. If it was called a rose, you'd say, how beautiful. So it's your mind that does it to you. So if you get heart, chop it up, mix it with other flavours and serve it in a thing like that, because a heart's inside you anyway, isn't it? <laughs> so if that came to the table, it looks a bit like a heart or... No, no well, that's a, well, an eggplant. Right. Yeah. Aubergine. And so that's served at the table like that and you chomp into it. Suddenly you've eaten a heart and you don't know you've eaten it. Have the you eaten heart? Yeah. Cooked, what does it taste? Yeah. Good, nice? Yeah, great. It's full yeah. of protein. See, meat is protein. Well, tongue I've had. There's smoked tongue, all sorts right. of tongue. Right, tongue. This is tongue. Oh, look what you did. You're terrible. Mm. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, mate, that's... <laughs> does that look rude? That was supposed to look no, funny. No, it's all right. It, looks, it does look funny, actually. It's a... Yeah. And that's steak and kidney pie. So if you got one of those and said, how'd you like to eat? That looks like my brother. I'll put that back. Uh, kidneys don't look too good. But if you whack them in a pie with a bit of steak, with a bit of that stuff, yeah. steak and kidney pie, it's wonderful. In fact, I went to a restaurant in Perth the other day, uh, Ruby's or something, three meal for me next time I'm there. But uh, their top, one of their top restaurants, and their main meal is steak and kidney pie. Hmm. So people love it. Uh, liver. Uh, when I was a kid, everyone ate lamb's fry and bacon. We Look, never oh, I love lamb's fry. Lamb's yeah. fry is terrific. That's really we good. always used to eat. Well, all you've got to do is get it, that food, change the shape of it. Or so grind it up or chop it up chop or add it, things and do things. Anything. Sure. Change the shape, change the name. Mm. Mm. So you'll eat lamb's fry and bacon, but if I said that was a liver... No, it, I, I understand that. I think that's your lamb's fry and bacon's nice. Kidneys with steak and kidney pie could handle that, but excuse me, is that... What is that, I think? That... I've, yeah. got, I've got to explain that that is an actual fair dinkum brain, but yeah, I know it's re that's the point I'm making. That looks repulsive, doesn't it? <laughs> looks like someone I know. <laughs> uh, uh, it does, but if it's served up like that, if you just get that, shove it in a blender, mm -hmm. zip with a bit of cream and an egg and all that, an egg, all that yeah, sort of business, yeah, sure, yeah. it comes out as a little pate. Serve that to people. They say, "I love it. I love it. What is it?" And you say, "Brain." They say, "Oh." Yeah, right. <laughs> So the shot is don't tell them. So Pull you're saying most of the, all of these things are edible, can be made flavorful, are cheaper, and if you really disguise them right and mix them up with some of the right things, it'll come out delicious. I think that we've got to vary our diet, and by varying our diet within the meat industry, because we don't, if we just eat steak, what happens to all the rest of the beef? Some of this is very good for you, too. Who's your tip for the cup? Uh, Hyperno. Hyperno. Good if Hyperno think. doesn't win, that's going to be Hyperno. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hyperno with the Oso Boco, right? Thank okay, you. thank Peter Russell Clark. Thank we'll you. be back at the wheel, don't go away. <laughs> thank you very much. Welcome back, Teresa, uh, the home economist from the Bar Mix Cooking School. Okay. Uh, bar mix and fine glassware go so naturally together. Right, uh, to, to, I'll tell you what she's doing. She's mixing uh, real fresh fruit and ice for a cocktail or for fruit punch, right in the glassware. Look at where it's all taking place in there, right? And never before have you been able to mix or whisk sauces and gravies right in the gravy boat. In the gravy boat. That's important, too. Fluffy coffee or chocolate drinks uh, can be made in your best china. And look at all this great food that's made with bar mix. Ice cream, pate, Christmas cake over and here. puddings, all of these different things over here. And it all looks pretty good to me, I'll tell you. Looks nice, doesn't it? Yes, it does. You right. can chop breadcrumbs and seasonings for fish or for poultry too in a beautiful glass like this, a glass jug. And the grinding mill, that's this one here, right there, that's, that's right? used uh, to grind hard and dry foods. We've right. got boiled lollies there, Don, which we've ground in the mill, and that's beautiful for That's the end result of the, of the grinding, well, is they've it? Got, yeah, they go a little bit firm after a while, but they're beautiful when you sprinkle them on cakes. And oh, all you yeah. do is just... Is the grinding mill? Terrific. And don't forget the, uh, the fabulous Barmix V-Blade Slicer. And uh, what you should do is you should order the slicer and a Barmix for Christmas now to ensure availability. Why don't you phone Barmix around Australia on these numbers to order, okay? And thank Teresa for these great food ideas once again. <laughs> Tonight on Don's Wheel, you could win this all-new 1982 Toyota Corolla CS manual sedan, valued at $7,350 on the road. Your new Toyota comes to you with the compliments of Pit Stop Motors, South Yarra, St Kilda and Elstonwick, one of Australia's leading Toyota dealers. And remember, Pit Stop Motors want your business. 
And in television, Intelligent Television, a sophisticated computer video game capable of providing hours of entertainment for every member of the family. In television, Intelligent Television. And $1,200 cash courtesy of Sunshine Kitchens, makers of kitchens like Contour. Sunshine Kitchens, makers of kitchens for over 65 years. And from the Seymour Cornelius range, this mink jacket valued at around $1,200. Seymour Cornelius furs and leathers offer fashion at your fingertips at every price level. And Hitachi frost-free side-by-side refrigerator freezer with large capacity plus all the latest features. Hitachi, where quality comes first. How are you doing? Very good. How are you? I understand we're going to have to rush along with the yes, wheel again. Yes, because of... Like because it, is it a problem? It is not a problem. Don. No, it's not really a problem. Bring it on, will you please, Max? I have... You've gone through skeptics and septics, what do you call them? Ske no, psychics. 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 You've gone through... I have got here, underneath... This Wh whoever oh, he is... Plug it in, Max, please. Whoever just he is, I hope he's happy. <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> All right. Yes, right. Hello, let me One. Out. Let me out of here. Two. Let me out of here. Three. It's a crystal ball. You're kidding. What's now this? Now, you thing? have to listen very, very carefully. And just drop the lights slightly if you can, gentlemen. Come in, Don. I want you here to share this with me. Everything that's good, I want you to share with me. Look very carefully now, and firstly, we'll see the venue for tomorrow's Melbourne Cup. Um, uh, hang on a sec. Hang on. Hang on. Oh. Uh, wrong track. That's the Greyhounds. Oh. <laughs> Let us have a close look now at the magic crystal bowl, and we'll see the winner of tomorrow's Melbourne Cup. The winner. No, 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 that belongs to Peter Russell Clark. Oh. <laughs> I see now a favourite coming in. I think it's called Magic Morton. I... <laughs> <laughs> what ran last in the Magic Cup, uh, the Melbourne Cup, the I Melbourne... wonder? <laughs> I think it was Moonface again. Did he win? Oh, yeah, there he is. <laughs> there he is. Good night, Crystal Ball. Okay. And we'll see you at the same time next year. Oh, perfect. Isn't that lovely? Yeah, good stuff. Yeah. Hey. Don, would you like to meet our first yes, contestant? Yes, I certainly would. He looks like a big, tough bloke. Yes, indeed. Right. It's uh, Murray Young of Cranbourne. Good day, oh, Murray. Hi, good to see you, mate. Hey, this is Don. Nice to talk to you got a pretty big hand and a strong handshake there, Maury. Did you ever play football or anything? Yes, I did. Yeah. You did? Yeah. Before? Hands feeling. Oh, association, Bert Cranwell. Oh, good on you. Yeah, good on you. Yeah. What do you do for a living? Well, I work at uh, Elliott's MF Services in Hampton Park. They're tractor uh, retailers. Oh. Uh, so you want Well, if you want to get a tractor retail, you can... Yeah, them. sure. Look after you, will you? Of course. What sort of yes, tractors so, are they? Uh, Matthew Ferguson. Oh, just about the best. Kubota. And yeah. uh, we've got a new one now, Iseki, which oh. is very good too. That's lovely. Yeah, terrific. You don't know one thing he said. Yeah, there. I he do. Was, was, did they come as convertibles too? <laughs> 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 what number do you want, mate? Number nine. Thank number nine, that's easy. Give it a big spin. Thank and we'll we see if we can't win a car for you. You want to get and Ken Morgan nervous. Go. Good luck. Here we go. Pacific tours, you like that? It's an eight-day Tassie special accommodated tour for two to Tasmania by tractor, and the value is around twelve hundred dollars. Australian Pacific offers quality and value for money in Tassie. Choose from luxury or budget tours with air-conditioned toilet-equipped uh, Mercedes-Benz coaches, such as Tassie pubs, Excuse camping me, how holidays. Does that, how does that and bus tours. get across the water to Tasmania? No, you pick up the bus when you get oh, to when Tasmania. You get to Tasmania. Sorry. That's the problem. You've got to find your own way to Tasmania. <laughs> Once you get there, you have a wonderful oh, time. Absolutely. It's I tell you what, it's twelve hundred dollars worth, and. Uh, yeah, are you, are you over 30, I assume, are you? Uh, yes, right, just well, a bit, Bert. Yeah. Well, there'll be a trip, uh, you know, that'll be suitable for you. Fine, What's okay. the name of the famous horse race to be held tomorrow? Melbourne Cup. You Dunk. got it, all right. Enjoy That's the trip. That's a trip, Murray. Right, uh, no fear. No fear. No fear. No fear. No all of that's good to see. Also tonight on Mornings, we have you had the chance of winning these fabulous prizes. 
You could win $1,200 cash from Amcal Chemist. Try Amcal's new double-strength blackcurrant flavour, Mega C, from Amcal's extensive range of own brand vitamins. And from Carpet Call, your choice of superb quality Homfray carpet to the value of $1,500. Carpet Call's enormous buying power gives you great savings. Also, the Morant's Aztec 30 home music system. The value is around $1,300. All components are coordinated perfectly, providing good looks and great Morant sound for your home. And also this general electric package. Oh, yeah. The amazing GE. Pot, hurry in, boy, you got a lot happening. The amazing GE pot scrubber with its penetrating three level dishwashing action. Yeah, I've had that plus too, the yeah. GE 290 DMX full length freezer. Oh, is that what it is? Yeah. Oh, right, yeah and that, that happens after this commercial break. We're on, taking a on, commercial we're break. We're taking a commercial People break. People bought time on this program. Right, 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 On second contestant, Val Smythe of Savage Street in Corindy in New South Wales. Okay, hello, Val. Yes, hello. <laughs> How are you? Well, thank you. Just, just a minute, say hello to Bert. Hi. How are you? I, I'm fine, thanks, Val. It's nice to talk to you. It's nice talking to you. What? We've still got a commercial up here and we can't see you. Oh, well, you will eventually. Oh, I hope so. Yeah. What are they on delay up there? One. Pardon? Let's hope that's a yes, there you are. Hello. Can you see me waving now? I can, great. Well, how come they don't see the start of the wheel? Oh, Which probably... station are you watching? Um, any N9 and 8 Tamworth. Pardon? Any N9 and 8 Tamworth. Are they electric? Are they? Yeah. No, 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 the guy's still there with the paddle wheel. Ah, I see. Oh, right. we'll tell him to pedal away. That's what, it, no. What's your tip for the cup? Uh, well, I like Harry White, so I'll say no peer. No peer, right? No what peer. number would you like, my love? Number three, I hope it's the car for Good you. Good luck, my sweet. Here's a... Uh, Here we best. go. All right. Are you still watching us? Yes. Good. You've got $1,200 cash from Amcal Chemists. Lovely. Uh, you You've can got try... $1,200 cash. Cash. Yes. Right. Oh. From Amcal's new double strength black currant flavor, Mega C, from Amcal's extensive range of own brand vitamins. Okay. Um, uh, the name Bart Cummings is associated with which sport? That's right. If okay, you'd like to be on right. Don's Field, post number spot 333, Richmond, Victoria, 3121. Don, uh, last Friday, I think it was, I needed to get in touch with you relatively uh, uh, urgently, and yeah. I rang through, and your housekeeper said, Oh, Mr. Lane is playing tennis at the moment, which didn't surprise me, <laughs> with Mr. Johnston. Yes, I was. And I thought, Mr. Johnston, Mr. <laughs> Malcolm Johnston, the yes, famous jockey. The, the jockey, yeah. He was You're mixing there. in circles now, aren't no, you? No, no. It was, it was Ray, Ray Warren, the sports announcer from Channel 10 up in Sydney, came down and picked up on tennis, and he brought Malcolm Johnston and a friend of his, a, 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 a horse racing writer from the paper, and they came and played tennis. i got to show you this. He left, give me a Malcolm Johnston left his jeans at the house. <laughs> now, I just want you to see this, right? You see a jockey, he changed into his tennis gear, left his jeans and look at this. <laughs> That's unbelievable. You don't, no, don't look through his pockets. I didn't even do that because I didn't know what was in there. <laughs> hey, have a, have a look at that. <laughs> don't tell me, you put that in there, don't do that. That's not nice. A couple of tote tickets. Let me see. No, Bit of money too? Yeah. Yeah, phone. That's your phone number. No, that's not. Oh, there you go, right. No. That's good. Can you yeah, believe fair it? Enough. Put yeah. the one next to you. you. I bet you couldn't even get those around one oh, leg. No. Hang on, what'd you drop now? The battery. More batteries. He oh, may no. need that tomorrow, Don. Don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't know that much right? difference. I've got, uh, are they really his backs? Absolutely, I'd love to keep yeah. them as a souvenir. I've got a, I've got a race museum at home. Okay, yeah. that's good. If he wins, he'll be even worth sure. more. Sure. I've right. got Mrs. G. <laughs> White of, Ex uh, of uh, Celsius Street, Excelsior Street in Reservoir. And I've got Eric Bellman. Listen, I've gone over and made 65 presentations on this, uh, car presentations on this show. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's a lot. So I want you to go over with Ken Morgan and make the presentation. I'll introduce you for a change. Go oh, ahead. okay. Can I keep Malcolm Johnson's money too? Sure, Mal. He's keeping your money, Malcolm. It's okay. <laughs> However much was in there. Um, uh, 65 cars isn't a bad record, um, and he's over there now to make another presentation. With Bert, would you say hello to Ken Morgan and our car winner from uh, last week?
How are you doing? Thanks, Grace. It's nice to see you. Thank you. And it's nice to see you too, Grace. Thank you. Dear. Congratulations on winning the car. It was a very easy win, wasn't it? Wasn't it? A lot of people during the week, of course, have said that because it was our 500th show, we made it so easy because we wanted the car to give away on our 500th show, and they were completely correct. They were. They were. Well, look, I knew nothing about it, but, uh, you know... Oh, no. <laughs> He's up <laughs> here. Uh, 500 shows, it was a thrill for us too. Sure, um, I knew you'd feel that way. I, I certainly do, it's been great being associated with the show. And surprise, surprise, it's not the car that uh, Mary won at all. That's the all new Corolla, which has been out Doesn't of the market. Doesn't it look beautiful, eh? 48 hours. Looks absolutely beautiful. Isn't that lovely? There you are. So the very, very first one, it's all yours. Have you got all the keys yet? I, sit, I haven't. Off you go. Thanks, this, by the way, is Thank Grace Borg, who's standing in for her mother, Mrs Cassar, from Altona in Victoria. And uh, look, wish Mum all the very, very best of happy motoring and a new Corolla. It's an exciting new venture. It's something, it's a second generation Corolla made just for Australia. It's going to make a big hit. And I hope it makes a big hit with Mum. It's beautiful. And I'd like to thank her, you people, on behalf of my mother. Thank you very much. It's our pleasure. What's your tip for the cup, Ken? Uh, I like Hyperno. Hyperno. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for being here. Congratulations once again. We'll take a commercial break and then come back with Don to say goodnight to you. Make it so free. I never thought that I'd feel so good inside and still feel me. Have a lovely day tomorrow. Uh, everybody, of course, I suppose, will be watching the Melbourne Cup or we'll have some, uh, some money resting on a horse uh, in the race. It's a great day for Australia. I hope you enjoy us. And uh, since tomorrow is Melbourne Cup Day, I'd like to leave you with just a little racing story. Uh, this is attributed to uh, leading American jockey, or when he was leading American jockey, Willie Shoemaker. Uh, he finished the race in fourth. He came in fourth in the race, and uh, when the race was over, the trainer walked up to him and he said, couldn't you have gone any faster? Why don't you go a bit faster? And Shoemaker said, well, I could have, but I had to stay on the horse. <laughs> <laughs> Good night. I love your faces. <laughs>